looking at the I am statements of Jesus, and all the preachers like to say there are seven I am statements. There are actually uh, some statements that aren't I am statements that really need to be included in this uh, series. For example, we talked first, of course, about um, Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, and then he later talks about being the living water, but he doesn't say, I am the living water, so that doesn't fit our uh, outline narrative. And I'm going to include at least the, um, if we get to it, at least the eight, or uh, one of eight I am statements. And so we're going to go from um, John chapter 8, verse 12, through the end of the chapter, and we're going to hear Jesus say, I am uh, the light, and we're going to hear him say, before Abraham was, I am, and that's going to kind of sandwich our um, discussion about who Jesus is. We can, we can peel back a little bit to chapter 7 and take a look at what... Um, We've got a couple of little ones that are evacuating. All right. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then go. <laughs> um, and, and back in chapter 7 of, uh, of John, um, my Bible, which I, I usually use the uh, Christian Standard uh, Bible, the CSB. How many of you have the Christian Standard or the Holman Christian Standard? And you know that that is the Baptist Bible. <laughs> and I, I say that kind of facetiously, but it was actually one of the motivations for, for this um, uh, translation was um, our Nashville Lifeway folks kept having to pay the NIV people and the ESV people because they copyrighted their versions. So we came up with their own version. It is a good translation, as I boasted to you before I know, uh, at least one of the folks that were involved in this translation. And you know, when you look at well, what version of the Bible, sometimes people say, well, what version of the Bible should I use? Um, one of the things that I recommend is that you get a parallel Bible that has two or three versions right there next to each other. You can kind of compare and, and see what they do. And we understand that there are um, different methods of translating. Uh, some translators have the idea that we just mainly want to get the idea across. Some translators say, no, we need to be absolutely faithful to what those words meant and get the most accurate English uh, out of it. So there's, there's a, a variety of uh, ways to translate, but I will tell you that this is authoritative. Uh, you also need to be careful about the people who claim that they have companion books to the Bible. This is the final word. And you need to be careful about those who have um, translated the Bible to fit their theology. For example, don't ever pay any attention to the New World Translation, which is um, the Jehovah's Witness Bible. They explicitly mistranslate um, the very concept of Jesus proclaiming to be God because they believe that Jesus is a created being. And I don't want to, you know, uh, always uh, railing about the uh, LDS or about uh, Jehovah's Witness, but I think we need to be uh, confident that we need to be very clear about whether we're going to uh, go with what this Bible says uh, or not. And so, um, get that warning. In fact, uh, bless their hearts, we had some uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in our neighborhood um, the other day, and they, you know, I appreciate their zeal. I uh, rolled up in, in the driveway, and I said, you can stay in your car, and he got out of the car and said hi, and I said, you can leave now. I did not accommodate them all. I wasn't mean, but I didn't need to listen to what they have to say, and I didn't need to argue with them. If the Lord had laid it on my heart uh, to witness to them, I would, but when you run, when, when you have uh, these um, evangelical groups that routinely go door to door, they know everything you're going to say as a conventional Christian. 
and uh, and I should have um, gotten it, but there's a uh, there, there's a verse in uh, the New Testament in one of the first, second, third John, I think, and some of you may know it offhand, but it says you, you don't have to give an audience. You know, we think we we want to, you know, we have to be nice, we want to be polite, we want to hear what they say. Uh, you do need to be nice, you do need to be polite, you do not hear, need to hear what they say. Now, does that mean that uh, we should never explore other belief systems or other religions or other denominations? No, absolutely, you should be as well informed so that you can be confident about what you do believe. But this confusion goes back a couple thousand years about who Jesus is. And we see in John chapter seven, um, I, I'm coming back around to this in my CSB version, the, in uh, the subheading for uh, verse 25 of chapter seven is the identity of the Messiah. Uh, and just before verse 40 another, is the people are divided over Jesus. And the subtitle over verse 45 is debate over Jesus' claims. And so in the context of, um, uh, of this constant debate and examination by uh, the Pharisees and skeptics and other crowds, um, this is where we see these conversations happen. Now, as we... Um, as we hear these guys, uh, let's take a look at verse 45 of chapter 7, just as a little background. The servants came to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him? The servants answered, no man ever spoke like this. Uh, then the Pharisees responded to them, are you fooled too? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which doesn't know the law, is accursed. We're going to talk about Jesus being the light today. That necessarily means that we're going to be talking about darkness and we can say with confidence that the Pharisees were in darkness, and the darkness was caused by their man-made, created belief system that was designed to be truthful and worshipful of the one true God, Jehovah. But they got sidetracked, and as we've, um, as I've warned from the pulpit many times, our belief system becomes the idol and the object of our belief instead of Jesus. And I've shared with you on more than one occasion my testimony about coming from the Bible Belt where everybody kind of understood Christianity in the 60s and the 70s, coming out to uh, Colorado, a spiritual desert, and people did not understand evangelical Christianity. They don't have the same uh, vocabulary. They have misconceptions about who Jesus is and how we worship and what we think. Um, and we are now in a state of uh, lost biblical literacy. People do not know their Bible. Um, in the past, when the Bible was considered, was elevated at its proper place in literature, it was, it was taught as literature, it was part of a, a, a Bible study, it was kind of part of the uh, cultural norm. And uh, I think as I've said before, you know, we lived 10 years in Hannibal, so Mark Twain, Mark Twain, Mark, Mark, you, you've got to do Mark Twain when you're in, in Hannibal. Um, and if you read Twain's writings, you don't get the idea that he's a born again Christian, but you do get the idea that he's very literate about the Bible. He makes many references, some of them obscure enough that the typical churchgoer needs to go and and look them up. So that is gone, as I've, as I've emphasized. We do not have biblical literacy. And in fact, we have some mythology about who Jesus is and what it means to worship and follow him. And uh, I think, again, I shared, it sounds like I'm doing a lot of retreading today, but uh, I shared with you that uh, I have a student in one of my Colorado Christian University online classes that I'm in the process of teaching who uh, calls herself a Christian, calls herself a minister, quotes Scientology, talks about karma, and she's very confident that she has earned her place in heaven. And I'm thinking, you've obviously read a lot of stuff, but is this on your list? Because that's absolutely contrary to what the Bible teaches in every regard. First of all, Scientology doesn't even consider itself a religion. Um, so this, 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 this question about who Jesus is is something that has been going on since 
his very life. Now, I want to also mention as we move into from that background information to uh, John 8, 12, you will probably see that at the end of chapter 8 or at the beginning of, uh, at the end of chapter 7 or the beginning of chapter 8, you might see a parenthetical statement that says some manuscripts do not include this passage. And this is the account of the woman caught in adultery where, where um, some, some men caught her in the act of adultery and were gathering stones to stone her, which was the immediate penalty uh, under the law of the day. And uh, uh, Jesus is on the scene and they point to him and they say, well, Jesus, you know the law, so it's okay to stone her. And Jesus says, yeah, but I want somebody who's never sinned to be the first one to throw a rock. Um, and then he, he does some uh, finger painting in the sand or the dust, and we don't know exactly what that says. So I, I, I want to be, um, I don't want this to, 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 to look like I'm ignoring the issue of reading the Bible and seeing a, a place where it says this might not have been in the earliest manuscripts. So there's a couple of theories about that. First of all, if you don't have that notice, and these verses from uh, John 7.53 to 8.11 are just incorporated in your Bible with no footnote, um, there's nothing anti-Christ-like, there's nothing anti-biblical, there's nothing wrong with this story it's it's very much like something we, we we would expect jesus to do and so we we don't have a huge doubt that that may have happened it may have been included in the very early manuscripts and then fairly quickly excluded because it's so scandalous that jesus would basically let this woman get away with that and say your sins are forgiven um, and the other theory is that we don't see, we see very little commentary about um, this story, and this account, and we don't see it in the earliest manuscripts uh, until about the, um, I think the 500s. And so a lot of scholars have said, somebody put this in there because they thought it was a good story and they thought it was appropriate. I will just tell you, it does not bother me that it's in there, it doesn't bother me that there's some question about whether that was an original story or not. Uh, first of all, any book that is subject to so much scrutiny that has the courage to write something in here, oh, by the way, there's some controversy about this passage, to me that just gives great legitimacy, legitimacy to the academic um, um, value of this book. So I just wanted to address that. But verse 12 of chapter 8, Jesus spoke to them again, um, them being the Pharisees. And I might want to retreat a little bit more and remind us what the setting is for this. As we see in previous, previous verses, Jesus is in the temple uh, preaching and teaching. And you may remember that the temple has a place called the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest could go one time a year. And then there was an area where only priests could go, and then there was an area where only men could go, and then there was an area where men and women could go, and then there was an area where even Gentiles could go. So there were several uh, layers. And Jesus was in the uh, area where the women could enter, and also where there were 13 uh, offering baskets for the temple tax and other designated offerings and some general Offering. So that if you just want to get a kind of a sense of uh, the environment in which Jesus is. Uh, some of you, if, you, if you've uh, been on a toll road and there's this big funnel looking thing and you toss your quarter in as you pass by, that's basically where 13 of those in, in the, the, the woman's uh, area of the temple. So here's Jesus teaching. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. Now, this is such easy preaching because light and darkness are such easy metaphors and easy comparisons to talk about. Um, 
And there are all kinds of illustrations about lighting a candle, about a dim light, about the lamp into my feet, and uh, of stories that you can tell. I'm a little nyctophobic. You know, so some of you, most of you know, I was in law enforcement for a, a few decades. And if they said, well, Joel, you can either have your gun or your flashlight, I would choose the flashlight every time. Um, because I don't like the dark. When it got dark, we used to get a newspaper delivery across the street. We lived out in the country, but there was a rural newspaper delivery. And we had a little tube that they put that in. It was always a day late. Um, but I would have a crop across the road. I'd go get the newspaper because it would come uh, late in the evening. And as we got into the winter months, it became dark, as it does here, very early. And I was never much of an athlete, but I'm positive I have established some Olympic uh, <laughs> style uh, timing, just getting past the porch and the bushes and the street and the fence across. Uh, and there was nothing but woods around our house. And once I got to the place where the newspaper was, there was nothing but woods on the other side of that. And of course, we know all kinds of things can happen in the woods in the darkness. I hated the darkness. I still hate the darkness. But the question is, do we love the light? How much darkness are we willing to allow into our lives? How much are we going to claim that our darkness is light? How much shadow can we stand? And the Pharisees absolutely missed the metaphor. Yeah. And as we've said before, when Jesus says something like, I am, the language that he used and the tense that he used and the audience that heard it heard blasphemy from him when he said, I am. And he didn't say, I am a light, I'm a good light, I'm uh, not a bad light. He says, I am the light. Now, one of the things that I had prepared this week is, is a whole slideshow. I've actually got the, um, the, the dongle here with me um, of about half or a third of the verses in the Bible that talk about light. It is a very consistent theme from the beginning of Genesis, where the light was separated from the darkness. Um, Psalm 139 talks about light and dark doesn't make any difference to God. He sees everything. So what was light created for? Light was created for us because we need the light. God doesn't. He is the light. We know that in heaven there's not going to be a need for any illumination because he's uh, the light of the world. We know that in the, um, uh, at night when the uh, Hebrews were marching through the desert, they would have a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Uh, we know that when uh, Gideon, with his 300 uh, knuckleheads, uh, surrounded his attackers and they had the candles that were inside their, their pottery and they broke the pottery and suddenly lit everything up and the enemy thought that there were thousands of them and started killing themselves. There's just all kinds of uh, passages in the book of Psalms alone, uh, the Lord is my light, constant theme, constant theme, constant theme delivers me from darkness. We see in the book of Job, one of the largest set of references to light and darkness. Just a fascinating subject that any of you cre could create a sermon around. I want to talk specifically about the Pharisees and see if there's something that we can glean from our own experience or for those around us about light and darkness. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself, your testimony is not valid. I don't know how many of you have tried to engage in a gospel conversation. Um, you know, we used to talk about witnessing and, and that, that got to be a sales technique. You know, I've got this pamphlet, I've got this outline, I've got this approach, I've got this close. Um, and so, now we've, we've kind of softened that a little bit and said that there's, you know, there's not just one way to witness, but you, you, you can try to engage in gospel conversations. 
Uh, did I talk to somebody about God today? Did I, did I hear a conversation about spirituality? Did I have the opportunity to shed some light on the subject? And one of the things that happens when a person feels like, oh, okay, here comes the church pitch, is they'll change the subject. This is exactly what the Pharisees did. You're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Anybody watch Perry Mason? That's a daily occurrence at our house. <laughs> um, we used to watch it on MeTV at 8, and then we found it online. And uh, now when Cheryl wakes up bright and early at 4.30 in the morning, I wake up to the muted sounds of... Da -da -da -da. <laughs> But one of the dramatic moments that you see in the trial is what? Your Honor, I object. That's not right. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't belong here. That's an argument that doesn't wash. That's an illegal argument. That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing. And that's what they were used to doing at the gates arguing about theology. Folks, don't spend much time arguing theology with people. If it is a gospel conversation, if it is headed toward uh, an exaltation of Jesus and telling somebody about Jesus and hope in Jesus and light in Jesus, then, then yes, go through that conversation. But if somebody's doing karate blocks the whole time, they're under conviction, so you might just want to say something. What is your problem with Jesus? Why is Jesus not enough? <coughs> Where does Jesus fail? Where does the Bible fail? Blah, 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 blah. All kinds of excuses. So they're saying, hey, you shouldn't say anything about yourself because it takes two witnesses to testify to any truth. So, yeah. Even if I testify to myself, about myself, Jesus said, my testimony is true because I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards, I judge no one, but if I do judge, my judgment is true because it's not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. You can just imagine them grinding their teeth. How dare you say you and God are witnesses to yourself. Even in your law, it's written us that a testimony of two witnesses is true. I'm the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Then they ask him, where is your Father? You understand the weight of this question. On the one hand, these people are saying that they are God's chosen people because of their father Abraham and their lineage. And the, on the other hand, they're not so subtly saying, oh, by the way, nobody knows who your daddy is anyway. We just know it's not really Joseph." And we have uh, heard the word bastard being used as a pejorative, as an insult. But you understand that Jesus grew up under the shadow in a day and time when it mattered of being a bastard child. Uh, even today, there are those who want to argue against the virgin birth that say, well, clearly, the rumors about Mary being raped by a Roman soldier are probably true. The people cannot stand to think about the virgin birth, even though it's prophesied, validated, Jesus validated it himself. So they're saying, who's your daddy? You don't even know, do you? You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would also know my father. He spoke these words by the treasury. That's just why we know where it was in the temple. While teaching in the temple, but no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. When people say Jesus was a good teacher and saying wise things, why is it that these other teachers of the law and of history and of scripture and Judea and Judaism wanted to kill him because Jesus was saying, I am God. And they could not accept it because they were in their darkness. They were satisfied with their belief system that they had created. And 
they wanted to eliminate him and felt very justified in doing that. It's just this was not an opportune time to execute this assassination. If you knew me, you would also know my father. Again, for those who say Jesus never claimed he was God in the scripture, they are absolutely ignorant not only of the text, but of the context that validates multiple times when Jesus identified with himself as, uh, with the Father as part of the um, Trinity. His hour had not yet come. Um, Jesus does, uh, engages in some prophecy here, uh, talking about being lifted up and those kinds of things. And um, let me just, and I'm, I'm already past my ideal time here. Um, in verse 30, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So his, the authority of his teaching came through uh, to those that had ears to hear. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciple, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's another verse that lots of people outside of Christendom know. Uh, you might hear it at graduation speeches as though the word truth means knowledge. But again, if we look at the context, there's an if that's just a conditional statement. So the truth will set you free if, and you go back up to the if, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If we want to back out of that, then the converse of that is also true. If you do not continue in me, if you do not continue in my word, if you don't continue to be my disciple, you will not know the truth because that's the condition of knowing the truth. Jesus is the light and the life. Anything outside of the acknowledgement of Jesus as who he proclaims himself to be is a walk in the darkness. There are many, many, many who want to have one foot in the light and one foot in the darkness. There are many who are living in darkness, in darkness, but they believe that that's the light. There are many that are deceived. My friends, I don't need to convince anybody here who's aware of their own life, their own friends, their own family, their own community, their own world, that would disagree if I say the world is full of darkness. The world is full of people who reject the light. My friends, I love this community. We returned here, God placed us here. I love the church. I, I work within the community as, uh, as a municipal judge and, and on the school board. So I love this community, but there's darkness here. Yeah. And part of the darkness is that people don't know that they're in darkness. And that's really dark, dark. I don't know that they, I don't know that I've seen a place where people think so much of themselves and their wisdom and yet are so much in darkness. It is a sad, sad state. My friends, we can't elect our way out of darkness. We cannot vote our way out of darkness. We can't program our way out of darkness. The light of the world is Jesus. If you want to light up the world, if you want to fix the problems in our culture, if you want to fix the, the, the despair, if you want to fix the, the uh, false, authentic living that people are proclaiming in the midst of their darkness, then we tell them about Jesus because he's the light. And you may come up with opposition just like Jesus did. You may lose something, you may lose a friend, you may lose a job, you may lose status, you may lose, uh, you may lose something, you may suffer, but you have the light, and they're in darkness. 
And earlier in John's book, when he introduces who Jesus is, he came to be a light in the darkness. And the darkness did not overcome it. So speak truth. Be the light. The other thing that we look at, if we had time, maybe we'll explore it some more next week, is that the Bible very clearly says that you are the light as well. You're salt and light. Let your light shine. We have the light of Jesus that has illuminated our lives, and we have the capacity to illuminate the lives of others through the light of Christ. So maybe you'll have the opportunity to do that this week, to have a gospel conversation, to share the light of Jesus, to encounter someone who's in darkness and provide some of that great, blazing, amazing, illuminating, healing light that is embodied, not in the church, but in Jesus himself. Mm -hmm.